Hey, this is Todd, and I'm talking about establishing your big, bad, evil guy, the great villain of your campaign. So when we're talking about establishing a villain, generally this comes down to you want to show your party that this creature, this entity, this person is formidable, right? You want, you're trying to show them that not only is it someone who is their equal, it is someone at least at the beginning of this campaign is beyond them and that you're showing that this creature, this thing, this, this villain is beyond them and they're going to, going to have to build up their strength, potentially find, you know, magic items or whatever they need to obviously level up and progress in their own abilities and then come back and take down this villain, this evil guy. And the method that comes up often for how to do this is to have the evil guy show up at the start of the campaign, beat down the party, and then leave. And the thinking on the GM side is often that this is perfect, right? He's going to show up. They're not going to be able to defeat him, and they're going to know they're going to need to level up. They're going to need items and allies and all these things to beat him, and then they will do those things. They'll come back and beat him. But uh, I think it's problematic for a few reasons to use this approach, and I'm going to give you some alternatives to that approach in the video. First, let me talk about why I think it's problematic. First of all, you know, I think the biggest thing is, you know, if, particularly if we're talking about Dungeons and Dragons and those style of games is the players are playing characters that are meant to be heroic. As such, it does not feel good when you're putting them in a position where they're just being victimized, where they can't do heroic things, where it's just a matter of how much you're going to beat them down, whether they're going to be saved by other forces and where they feel like they're at the mercy of these things that they can't control. It's not a great feeling. It's not usually why people come to play these games. It wasn't so much a problem if you look back in the history of the game, when the game was mostly about kind of sandbox exploration of places, if you want to think about you're, you're playing the game and your mindset is basically like this world is kind of a web, right? You can go any direction you want and you can follow these threads. So if you come to a certain junction of threads and there is a, uh, a dragon there, you can always retreat from it. It's in your mind because you know that it's not the single path forward. You know that, okay, I can just go back and I can come back to that room later. I know that there's all these other rooms I can explore and there's nothing that tells me that I need to go to that room. That room, that encounter is not mandatory. It's just there. So I can leave it. I can go do other things. But the modern campaign, with an, we're talking about sort of a narrative style campaign, is much more like a single line with plot points along that line. And these plot points, they sort of play in your mind like they're hurdles. They're obstacles that you're meant to overcome. So it's almost like now you're playing the game as it's sort of an obstacle course, right? And part of it may be swinging along, swinging across a, a pool. Part of it might be climbing a high wall. Part of it might be going, crawling under barbed wire. But you know when you get to each one of these that the mindset is not that maybe I should just step back and leave the obstacle course and then come back to it later. The mindset is that I'm supposed to do this. I need to figure out a way and there will be a way for me to get to the next obstacle. So if I come up to the barbed wire and I can see it's three or four feet off the ground and I can say, okay, I can crawl underneath there, right? If I get to the wall, it's a high wall and I know I can't jump and grab it, but I say, okay, there's this rope. I grab the rope, I climb up it. That's sort of the approach that is fostered in most modern sort of narrative campaigns. So when you present an encounter to a group in that campaign, this villain shows up, the natural instinct is to look at it in that sort of obstacle course mentality. It is meant to be looked at and it's meant to be overcome. It is not meant to be backed off from. And so you'll find a lot of players and a lot of groups will have trouble retreating from encounters. They will have trouble seeing an encounter as something that needs to be removed, needs to be, you know, retreated from. They'll look at it instead as we just haven't overcome it yet or something needs to happen. We're going to overcome it or we just haven't figured out what we need to do to overcome it, but it can be overcome. And so when you do basically the ultimate can't be overcome battle, which is this evil guy showing up, it can really cause a dissonance between what you're trying to do and how your party is thinking and will act and react. And what can happen often is that the party does not retreat. You have planned it that they're going to retreat. They don't. And you get kind of caught in a box. And it's not a good place to be. Because there are only a couple of outs from you to preserve what you're trying to do. And save the party from a potential TPK. Because if they're not retreating, they're not leaving. What happens when the 
big evil guy is going to keep thwacking them. Either you have to start fudging dice and, you know, trying to think up quickly something else to do, or, you know, you can have the big evil guy knock them out and then leave, or you maybe you can have some kind of NPC cavalry run in to save them. But when you look at these options, none of them are very fulfilling for the party. On the first hand, if you're going to have the big bad evil guy knock them out, it's going to be pretty transparent what happened. It's going to be pretty clear to the players that they couldn't have won, that they were just being sort of toyed with. And by knocking them out, it kind of makes that even more plain because if they really were a threat to the evil guy at this point, why would he just knock them out or it? Why wouldn't it just kill them outright? Why would it do the sort of silly kind of almost bond type thing by putting them in the spot and then bailing them out. It doesn't feel right. And it's going to feel like, okay, we were just meant to get beat down like this. And again, that's not a fun feeling. And it's a similar thing if the cavalry shows up. So the big bad evil guys in there thwacking away, thwacking away, people are getting knocked out. And then suddenly some force runs in, saves the day and bails the party out. It's going to feel cheap. It is going to feel exactly kind of how it seems like that. Okay. Again, we were just meant to get beat down, and then now we're beholden to these guys who came in and saved us. Not a great feeling. We don't feel heroic. We feel like we're just victims. And, you know, it can kind of leave a bad taste in a player's mouth. And I can speak from personal experience because this happened to me in a campaign I played back in college. We got dumped. My party got dumped through some kind of like kind of evil dead portal into another land and right in the middle of this battle. Some guys, they were sort of, they were sort of centaurs, but they were kind of instead of or I, maybe there's an official name for them, but they were kind of half man, half half uh, what was it scorpions, and they're attacking us, and it was really hard battle, and you know there was constantly this sort of clock of we're in this battle, we're being overpowered, and then we can see kind of in the distance it was like a vast plain or almost desert, this sort of cavalry kind of forces are charging in, but you know they're taking a while to get there, and we're fighting all this time. And the party members are going down and, you know, we're just, God, we're just scrapping. And to be clear, at this point, it felt like a really great encounter. And I remember at the end of it, my character and another player's character were still, you know, conscious. And we were just scrapping and scrapping. And it looked like we'd finally made it because, you know, the clock struck zero. The cavalry showed up and the scorpion guys were in full retreat. But the problem was that the GM's plan was not to have us rescued in that way. It was clear that his plan, and I'll tell you why in a minute, is clear what his plan was to have us show up in a way where we were sort of beholden to these cavalry people, right? So me and this other character, our char- other player, our characters are kind of standing tall, you know, and this wasn't the plan. The plan was that we were supposed to get beaten down and then saved. So what the GM had happen was that the scorpion guys were in retreat, the cavalry's about to show up, me and this other character were like, yeah, we did it. We're kind of standing tall. We feel good. One scorpion guy runs back from being uh, retreating, knocks us out, turns around and runs again. And, you know, it was so clear that this was just so that we could all wake up. And, you know, I think he put us in a prison or something and we had to prove that we were good. And, you know, that these guys didn't believe us. And we had to sort of, sort of, uh, you know, bow down to these new, you know, cavalry people, this new kingdom that we'd run into. And it felt so crushing because it just totally robbed us of this amazing moment we had where we overcame these odds and we did this thing, but it wasn't meant to be that. He had this one outcome in his mind, which was we had to be defeated so that this other thing could happen. And it, it was terrible. And you know, it's been, I don't know how many years and I still think of it and I still just makes me angry thinking about it. You don't want that to be your player's thoughts when they finished the session of just how we got cheated or jammed or how unfair it was or how we had no chance. Let the party be heroes. And as I'm going to explain, you can establish your big bad evil guy without victimizing you know, your players. And the way you're going to do that is by using NPCs instead, right? So I think on TV tropes, and I'll link to it, they have, uh, they call it the wharf effect. And the idea is that on Star Trek, uh, the next generation, you had Worf, who was the sort of biggest, baddest, rootin' tootin'est officer on the Enterprise, you know, strongest, I don't know, fastest, but definitely, you know, the fighter, the guy who's toughest. 
So when they wanted to introduce an alien, another, some kind of entity, and they wanted to show that this guy was really tough, there'd be this scene where he beats down Worf. You know, and so this was the cue for us as the audience to say, if Worf was the meanest, baddest, rudinest, tootinest officer of the Enterprise, and this guy came in without breaking a sweat, just put Worf to sleep, that guy's tough. That guy's bad. And so they did this a lot. And it's, there's, I think there's a video on YouTube somewhere. Maybe I'll try to find a link to it where there's a montage of Worf just getting beat down by different races, different entities, different things to show how tough they are in relation to the, the crew. So, you know, the concept is to take that same idea, but instead use an APC. So this takes a little bit of a setup. And I think that it's something that is oftentimes overlooked when you're setting up campaigns is you don't have to have the campaign call, the thing that starts the great campaign in your first session. You know, you can build it up, have a little bit where maybe the PCs get to get comfortable in the world and move around and do stuff and then have this sort of campaign opening called adventure happen. So if you have this little area of time beforehand, you can establish different NPCs that are around. You can establish NPCs who are stronger than the party, who maybe they look at saying, this is a powerful person, or you set up in the world as being powerful. And then when you want to bring in your evil guy, this great villain of yours, have them demonstrate their power by taking on the powerful people you've put in place and beating them up. You know, it doesn't have to kill them, beat them up. And then that is going to show the party through the reference, you know, through reference to this other, you know, NPC, they're strong. So if you've set up a guy that, you know, this guy is a warrior and he's seems to be really powerful and everybody knows he's powerful and strong and then something comes in and decides to, you know, duel that warrior and just whips their butt, then now you've set this other, you know, character up, this other uh, entity as being stronger. And you can do that with, you know, any kind of power you want to show, right? Maybe you have a, a there's a great wizard that lives in the area and He's got a tower and he seems to have everything put together. He seems to be high level and then have another sorcerer, you know, show up and just have magic combat and just beat down the wizard. And that will, you know, inform the party to how strong this new power is. And what it also allows you to do is it allows you to have this moment where you're showing that you're this evil guy's powerful and also allow the, the players to play their characters heroically. Let the party be the cavalry. If you're going to have someone get beat down and then get saved, let the party do the saving. So, you know, have them be in the tavern and then they get someone come in yelling that, you know, Worf the warrior is getting beat down in the, in the town square. Have them rush over, save Worf. The evil guy goes about his business and then they have both got to do something heroic and they've got to see the power of the evil guy, right? They didn't have to be one or the other. Same thing with the wizard. If the if the wizard, you know, is getting beat down, maybe they see it, maybe in the distance they see the tower and it's on fire with magic and everything. They run over just in time to help the wizard or or distract the evil guy and the wizard can escape or whatever happens. And again, you've shown that the evil guy is powerful because he's more powerful than the wizard and the party also gets to do heroic things. Uh, there's uh, another method, which is kind of very similar to the wharf effect, but it's almost the opposite, right? Which is instead of, a big bad evil guy showing up and beating down Worf, what they do is you take Worf, have him try to beat down the evil guy, and then be unable to. So it's kind of like the if one was sort of an offensive display of force and power, this is now a defensive place, show of force and power. And I think you see it a lot, I think, in anime or, or you know, in, in, in big monster movies, you know, where if Godzilla's coming around and you'll see them said missiles and all kinds of explosions and it'll just seem smoky and everyone will be thinking like, Oh, did they get it? Oh, he must be down. We, we sent 50, you know, nuclear warheads at him and then the smoke clears and the monster keeps coming. <clears throat> that's a, that's essentially the same effect. So to take the wizard example, if the party sees their this wizard thing is powerful, send some kind of empowered fireball and it slags the entire market square and everything's melting and it, just plumes of smoke and everything. And then the big bad evil guy walks out of smoke and just kind of brushes it off. No big deal. Another display of power. Only this time it's on the defensive side, right? So instead of saying he can beat down the most powerful people we know, instead it's the powerful, most powerful people we know can't hurt this guy. You know, he's that strong. 
Uh, and another thing you can do is you can substitute, you know, things for, you know, people, right? So, for example, let's say that there's a fort or a castle that's standing. That's obviously going to be something that is going to show strength and power. It's just it's big. It's stone. It looks like it can withstand an army. If one bad guy shows up and melts the walls to go in and grab something that they need for their infernal designs, that's going to be a big show of power. You know, the, the dragon that burns an entire village or, you know, the warrior that takes down an entire, you know, militia by themselves, whatever it is. These things can also be shows of power. And again, you can have the party show up too late to make a, a key difference, but able to do something, even either just to see the end of it or to go in and save people or save things or, you know, do some kind of rescue. You know, the idea here is they can remain heroes, give them heroic things to do. And by the way, these heroic things can lead to more things. So if, you know, they are small fry, right, and they're doing these things, but they end up going to see the local lord, and this is where the big bad evil guy comes in and reduces the castle to rubble, if the party goes in and saves this local lord, that gives them an in to maybe the campaign. Maybe that's where the local lord tasks them. It gives them a contact. Maybe it gives them access to factions or other rewards. There are all kinds of ways you can use that event of their rescue or whatever they the heroic deeds that they do can then have meaning going forward. Um, another thing you can do is not have the evil guy do anything at all, right? If you think of Lord of the Rings, Sauron doesn't come in and do anything, but everybody is in fear and awe of him that it you can't help but as a reader, as an audience, you can't help but think about how powerful he must be. So, you know, going back to these NPCs we've created that are strong and powerful and wise, if they're all in fear of some entity, then that entity is made powerful, right? If if the entity is so strong that you can't say their name or write their name down or, you know, put their uh, representation in stone or on paper, that's going to show they're extremely powerful. And if enough people in your this world believe that and act on that fear and they are stronger than the party that is going to make the party understand that strength. So for example, if on some kind of initial dungeon delve, they go into say a temple and the temples had all kinds of hieroglyphics or bar reliefs and they're all scratched out. They're going to wonder why these representations scratched out. If they go back to town and it turns out that it's some entity who's they've tried to erase from the world. And now that entity, you know, now you start playing with the idea that there are signs as entities coming back that plays into this strong, if, that plays into the power of that entity. If it's so strong that they don't even want its name or its image or anything in any kind of record, it must be strong. Right. And that's kind of that Sauron sort of overwhelming evil kind of force. Now, some are some some forces are going to have kind of name value. If you're familiar with Lord of the Rings and you're playing in that Middle Earth and someone says Sauron's coming back as a, you know, players and characters you're going to know, right? And I think, you know, Orcus is a big, or, or Vecna, you know, these are big ones that everybody kind of knows and so you know to be afraid of them. But when you're doing your own, you need to do that kind of legwork. They don't have monster manual entries or deities and demigods entries where it says how exactly how strong they are. They don't have lore of years and years of being in the role-playing game. So what you do to kind of build that up is you have that in the world. You bake it into this world you're building and you do that in that kind of first segment. So if you know that there's some death Lord that some cult is trying to, you know, uh, bring back, uh, you know, from the dead or, or, or out of some kind of hibernation, spend the first couple of sessions with maybe the party's doing other things, but they're running along into these traces of this death Lord and his cult. And then when they go back to ask these strong, wise, smart people about it, those people are deathly afraid that is going to give that entity strength, right? It's going to give that entity power. If the 10th level, whatever wizard is afraid of this, this thing and you're level one, you're going to think, well, this thing must be, really strong. And that's really what you're trying to do. And, but the idea is again, you're doing it not at the expense of the party. You're doing it while still allowing the party to do the things, you know, that they can do to be heroic, to feel strong, to feel empowered, to feel like they have choices, to feel like there are things to do. So 
when you're planning your evil guy's grand entrance and you're thinking about doing it at your player's expense, please, please, please just take a few minutes. Think about how that plays out. Don't just think about it, about how you'd think in a movie it might play out. Think about as your players, what it would be like to go into an encounter that you know they can't win and how that might feel to them. And then maybe instead of going that route, think about ways that you can keep your party empowered while still showing the strength, the power of this villain that you're introducing, right? And you can do that through having powerful NPCs get squashed, right? Um, having them fail to be able to squash the bad guy. Uh, you know, having them just be afraid of just the mention of the bad guy, right? Just in the lore of the world, putting that this guy's feared. And I'm sure there are other ways and there are lots of different things you can do. I just wanted to stress in this video to look at these other options in lieu of doing it at the expense of your party. Um, and you're always going to find on the internet when these things come up that you're going to find people who say, oh, but it worked for my party. Oh, I did it and it was fine. And of course, you may have the party that it works for. You may be the one that can pull it off and do it with the nuance and everything to make it work. But it's an idea that I think in general is just not the best. And particularly when there are other ways you can do it that don't have the pitfalls um, that subjecting your players to just a beat down. If you enjoy videos like these, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. It helps me out a lot. I also have a Patreon if you'd like to support the show in a different way. Thanks for watching.